Hello, Chris. What's up, Jason? I haven't talked to you for like two weeks. I know. My, it's always so weird, like talking to you on a regular basis and I don't talk to you. It's like I feel so empty inside. It it really does. Like it's super noticeable where I'm like, oh, I miss Jason. Like we don't get we don't get those uh conversations in every week and I, I like it it builds on me where I'm like, oh man, like I wonder how he's doing and uh you know, last week you were traveling and doing a talk, which is yeah. why we missed it. Yeah. I so the kind people at Nash RV, which is the National Ruby Group, asked me to come speak. And I was like, sure. Uh, Cause Shannon has family there. So anytime like I'm like, let's go to Nashville. It's like, well, let's just go spend a weekend. It's like a little. Oh, that's, that makes it so much more convenient. And how far is that? That's not that far for you guys, right? No, on, on no traffic. It's about two and a half, three hours. So. Oh, that's great. It's like two hours for me to drive up to visit my parents. And so that's like... Not a thing I'll do every, you know, during a uh, night or something, but like going on the weekend is kind of perfect. It's really close enough, but far enough away. I kind of have to plan for it. So, yeah, it it helps working remote because like, yeah, it doesn't matter where you're at then. Yeah. And I don't have to like tell anybody I'm leaving. So like we left Wednesday at like one o'clock and I was like, Shane, you drive? I'm just going to work in the car. And then, like, you worked on the road? Yeah. That's cool. How's that yeah. work out? Do you have a hotspot or a user yeah. phone? Another ring or? mobile and I'm supposed to get like 10 or 15 gigs of hotspot, but I'm pretty sure like it's unlimited. Cool. Yeah. I think don't they like just throttle you after your allotted stuff and it's just a little slower or something. Yeah. It gets, it slows down. Um, but I haven't like, gotten to like unbearable points yeah it was actually i was like joking with shannon because it was actually more reliable for me to be on my t-mobile connection than like on my home comcast connection <laughs> i saw you tweeting about your home connection being terrible that was yeah funny. it's dropped i'm not exaggerating probably like 12 or 15 times the last two weeks man that's awful i, yeah. I had a little bit of trouble with spectrum uh and ch- or charter and yeah, it it's kind of resolved now, but they there's this new loft apartment building down the street from me and like on the sidewalk that I'm pretty close to, maybe a hundred feet from, um, there's like new AT&T panels they put in the sidewalk mm-hmm. to run the cable. Uh, and I think they ran fiber over there, but they won't run fiber to my house. Naturally. And I'm like, come on guys. But you know, there's probably some reason for that. Like, if I got, they offer five, five megs down or a hundred megs down. And I was like, number one, like, why are you still selling five megs down over fiber connections? And, you know, if it's a hundred megs down well, and, and it's still on a fiber line, like, why can't I just get, you know, gigabit and never, ever could find someone to answer that for me at, with at and And I was like, come on guys, like just just run something to me. And I don't know if it's their hardware or something that runs the fiber lines that, um, you know, they just haven't upgraded that yet, but they're running those lines, um, or something just to be ready for the future or what. But yeah, I'm like frustrated with that. Although my spectrum isn't awful. It's just the upload speeds when they're not symmetric or a pain in the butt when you're uploading screencasts or, podcasts every week you want something that's fast for uploads and it's still not normal yeah it's i don't know like so i i looked at AT at&t because it was dropping so much and like when we first moved in this house we got at&t uverse which is like their Uh whatever not fiber but not dsl like low level i don't know and then so I was like, well, I wonder if I can get that back. And they don't even sell it like in my neighborhood anymore. So I cannot get anything but Comcast. So oh, man. Yeah. When we were when I lived at my parents, um, when I was like in high school and younger, um, we had in that town it was like an AT and T exclusive monopoly for like cell phone or something. And it was like 
no Verizon is even offered here or whatever. And I was like, this seems terrible that you can't. How do you get a, a monopoly over this stuff? <laughs> it sounds awful. Like someone, someone dropped the ball. <laughs> Before, uh, we should probably stop talking about internet because it's not Ruby, but... Before we move on, I do Ruby on the internet, man. (laughs) T-Mobile is doing like when they roll out 5G, they're going to roll out in certain markets like home broadband, like over 5G. Ooh, that's cool. I think it's super cool because like, at least in my area, like whenever my internet goes down, I always know my phone internet's going to work. Like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tout towers like for me for some reason just like never go down uh and so i i'm to a point in my life where like i much rather rely on that than this cable in the ground that seems to always get cut or put in front of my house yeah it makes you wonder if uh those cable or you know those companies if they're gonna start seeing some serious business issues if they can start delivering or if the the cell phone towers can start delivering home internet then yeah, that might be some serious competition for them. Ooh, I like this. I hope so. They need it. That'd be great. I would love to have, you know, wireless, fast internet to my house without having to deal with any of these cable providers or whatever. It's painful. You could, in theory, just take it with you. Yeah, yeah. That's so awesome. It makes sense. I mean, the technology is probably pretty tough for them to build that. But, yeah, I think uh, it was weird my phone says in certain parts of town like downtown that um it shows 5g on the on the iphone oh you have at&t yeah but it's definitely you know the the phone doesn't support that so i don't know why they they display that at all on the phone big like hurrah like on twitter about that yeah Um, it seems disingenuine yeah it's blatantly not 5g they call it what 5g e or whatever yeah uh, it's bad. It sh- they shouldn't do that at all, but they're going to do what they're going to do. Um. Anyway, so <laughs> I was in Nashville. Uh, I gave a talk on uh, my blog post I wrote earlier in the year using Ruby in 2019. And my goal was, like we talked about last week, to take the audio because they recorded it and put it up. But... Uh, I forgot to ask for it when I left that night and then I haven't been in contact to get it yet. So here we are. (laughs) But hey, that's the first time we missed a week in like a long time. Yeah. Well, it'll be good and we'll post that whenever we do get it. I think it'll be an interesting attempt for, um, you know, like a different style of, of episode. I'm curious to see what it will be like to listen to a talk uh on a podcast that'd be kind of cool yeah i tried to i tried to i don't know how good of a job i did but i tried to like when i I showed some code and i tried to like actually like explain it like somebody wasn't looking at the screen so Mm, i like that yeah i'm gonna give a talk at uh our local ruby meetup next month i'm gonna figure out what you're talking about yeah, I'm going to talk about, well, I did a couple episodes on Go Rails, or maybe it was one. I can't remember now. Um, I'm going to talk about contributing to Rails and kind of the the stuff that you have to keep in mind when you're contributing to a huge project like that, um, you know, and, and just like the process for all of that. I know that that was something that having recently done that i knew that when i was like a beginner um i was always like man i would love to contribute to rails someday and now i'm like still excited to do that it's just like i know i can um i just don't have as much time to go do that so um my you know sort of dreams of being a rails contributor uh are are still real but you know it's a little more practical or realistic now but it is cool to be able to do that and so i'm going to talk about that like you know you various ways you can get started if you wanted to contribute to docs that's probably the easiest one and then you know if you want to actually contribute code well you might be able to fix a bug if you stumble upon one that's a legitimate one 
uh, a lot of times those are like user error. And so it can be pretty tough to find a, a bug unless you're, you know, working on a new feature in Rails, uh, like action text, like I was trying to learn how that works before it comes out. So, you know, uh, that's kind of the idea of the talk, just to talk about contributing to open source and kind of the challenges you get with such a large project. It's much easier if you're doing some, you know, contributing to a smaller gem. Um, even something as, as like long term as uh, devised or something is hard to contribute to these days because it's like, well, it's pretty stable and there's not a whole lot of new things we need to add and not a whole lot of bugs left because, well, you know, there's a lot of people working on it. So uh, I want to just kind of go over the whole gamut of things and, and talk about making contributions. Um, so it should be fun. I haven't given a talk in ages. That sounds like a good talk. If you record it, if they record the audio, you should also post it. Yeah, I uh, I don't know. I would probably need more of like a... Well, I, I'm, I'm going to try and record it. Maybe I'll bring my microphone to you if I have like a little... Um, I think I'll probably have a little stand or something that I could set that on. Um, cause I, you know, don't know. I might need like a lapel mic or something depending on if I'm walking around or whatever. But yeah, I haven't given a talk in quite a long time. And it's funny cause everybody is like, well, I tell people I don't really like public speaking and they're always like, what do you mean? You record videos every week and publish them on the internet. And it's like, yeah, I get it. But you know, talking alone to your computer at home in your basement is different than talking to a room for, full of people. <laughs> it's it's funny because I actually find the latter harder. Really? Yeah. Well, I certainly found screencasting to be like extremely hard when I started. Like it was to the point where I couldn't sit and I mean, this is the thing you have to remember. Like if you're a programmer, your job is to spend like 80 or 90% of your, your actual coding in your own head where you're thinking about things and how it works and whatever. And you're, unless you're pair programming, you're not really talking out loud uh, when you're working as a, a programmer. So getting into doing screencasts was such a weird thing for me because I realized I don't know how to talk while I'm coding. Like uh, my brain has been tuned so long to just sit there and think. Um, and that's it. And so I had to kind of undo that and unpack it. And I just like sat down and recorded 15 minutes of screencasts every day until um, I had a few of the early episodes. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to record 15 minutes a day. Even if I throw it away, at least I recorded something just to maybe become more comfortable at this at some point. So, you know, it's a it's definitely a weird thing. Like I couldn't stand listening to my own voice. I thought I sounded stupid or whatever, you know, it's so funny and it, it didn't really matter, but you, you do have to overcome that stuff because it is really painful to do, but it, I feel like it's probably this similar thing. If you're afraid of like public speaking, you just have to go do it and realize, you know, it's not really that scary, but it's going to take some practice and just some attempts to figure it out. That's fair. Well, when do you say you're giving that talk? Um, it is like a month from, it's like the second Monday of the month, I believe. Um, oh, okay. so it would be like, it will be, yeah, I believe the second, yeah, the 13th of May looks like okay so after rails comp cool we've speaking of rails comp that's coming up soon and we've got hopefully a couple interviews we're going to do there which will be fun yeah we have two for sure one maybe so we'll see yeah it'll be fun we i mean we sit here remotely several states away and talk to each other it'll be it'll be different to talk in person <laughs> Probably just sit there and not talk. Yeah, we'll just angrily glare at each other, and you'll <laughs> listen to that for an hour. <laughs> so we were kind of talking beforehand when we first started. I guess like first few months we were into this, we started working on a project, and we called it like I don't know, secret project. Yep. Um, 
but I think you're ready to talk about it. So yeah, share. Yeah, we, um, well, what was it last August? You and I started working on this, uh, calling it jumpstart pro. Uh, I did a screencast on like building a rails application template that uses, you know, you run the rails new command and you give it a template and after it generates your rails app, it runs whatever, uh, additional changes you want to add to your code. Um, and we were talking about that cause tons of people use jumpstart, uh, the free one that I made and which is funny cause that was our actual first attempt at like what this project came to be. Yeah. So there's like, you know, a, I guess the big problem with, um, the free or the sort of rails, uh, the, the, The Rails application templates are kind of too trivial because um, you have to go add in exceptions for like literally every single thing that you're going to add. So if you run this against Rails 6 that uses Webpacker, like you're going to have a whole different set of code that runs against Rails 5.2 or lower that uses the asset pipeline. So all your JavaScript has to be different and everything. And it's just kind of a huge pain. And... um, so, you know, we decided that we were going to build, like, we're going to create a new Rails app and go and configure it all for you and build that out and sell that as a template. So, you know, the the free Jumpstart is awesome. Um, you can find all the stuff on jumpstartrails.com, by the way. But uh, we built the free template, which was like, cool, we we're going to install Devise and Bootstrap and all these other little things for you, like Sidekick. And uh, this is what I use for like almost every Go Rails screencast right now. Like when I create a new episode, I generate an app with the free jumpstart just so that I have a nice template to start with. But to go and do like payments and things, it's a lot more complicated. And there's just a lot of stuff um, to go and build out. Uh, You want probably team support and uh, some other things. So... That was where Jumpstart Pro kind of came into mind. And uh, we we just were like, well, we should go build that. So that was a fun weekend where we got together and drove out. Um, I drove down your way and we hung out the whole weekend getting stung by mosquitoes in the in the hotel. And, uh, you know, after the we tried week. to go to a casino. Yeah, <laughs> that was an adventure of a weekend. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's, it's cool. Like, uh, this, um, Monday, was it two days ago? No, yesterday. Uh, I'm already forgetting my days yesterday. I think we onboarded the first, uh, beta customer, which is super fun. So, um, you know, seeing how that goes will be really interesting and, and we'll probably onboard a few more beta customers. So if anybody's interested, uh, send me, you know, a Twitter DM or email me or whatever, um, or what, whatever, join the email list on jumpstartrails.com. But we're going to start, you know, launching this pretty soon officially. But, you know, we, we wanted to make sure this template had sort of, uh, well, one of your ideas that I thought was the coolest was like, you know, what about how WordPress has their little, you know, set up walkthrough when you install it for the first time and it asks you to connect to the database and stuff. So we have actually built that out in Rails, which I've never seen before. So what's cool is you clone our our um, application and when you boot it up for the first time, you get the uh, this welcome screen that goes in only in development. This is uh, done. So then it goes into our admin area and it allows you to configure the app um, in the jumpstart admin. So you can turn on things like sidekick and define your business name and your product name and you like your support email and all that stuff gets plugged into the the site itself. So it's, you know, links are populated, your receipts have the correct address and business name and logo, um, those types of things. So it's, it's pretty cool. You go through and set up your email provider. You don't have to remember any of the SMTP settings and that type of thing. So you can just just like go and choose that I use SendGrid and drop in your keys, which is awesome. So we try to make sure that it was like just a great fast way to get up and running on uh, a, a new 
SaaS product. Because the difference between Jumpstart Free and Jumpstart Pro is mainly the Jumpstart Pro has payments. And we've built, in this same time, we built uh, the PayGem, which is about to be ready as well. I think it's probably ready. I just haven't officially you know, released uh, version one yet, but that that's kind of a wrap around Stripe and Braintree so that they work um, almost the same for standards like subscription stuff. There's that, that's kind of what I use on go rails where I love Stripe. It's the best, uh, you know, payment provider right now, but I can't ignore PayPal customers. Um, and especially if you have any global customers, PayPal is going to be kind of important so we built that gem to kind of be a wrapper around both of those. And that's kind of what's powering all the payments in Jumpstart Pro. So we've, uh, man, I mean, August doesn't seem that long ago, but we put a lot of time into this. So, yeah, you, you've been cranking away at it. Yeah. So. There's been a lot of, a lot of weeks of just going through and fixing bugs and, adding features and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, we've got it set up too with um, an admin interface and we have Tailwind CSS. And that's a difference between Jumpstart Free and Jumpstart Pro. Uh, free uses Bootstrap um, and then Pro actually is pretty sweet. It's using Tailwind's 1.0 like beta right now. So we're, we're kind of waiting until Rails 6 is more stable, like RC1. Um, before we really do anything with this, uh, which is why it's kind of in beta. But um, we wanted this to all be ready to go when Rails 6 comes out. And then Tailwind 1.0 is in beta. And we're like, well, we should do that too. So um, Andy, uh, our friend here in St. Louis that works at Dribbble, um, has done some great stuff on the design. So it comes with Jumpstart Pro has this like sweet theme that's already set up by default. So all of your scaffolds and everything will use that theme and then it has pagination built into the scaffolding and uh, they'll automatically add themselves to the nav bar and some cool stuff. So like Tailwind is kind of more friendly like Bootstrap. Um, whereas if you were to start with Tailwind by itself, it's uh, it's great for using for if you have a designer but we wanted to make sure this like had a default theme that was pretty good as a starting place that was like extremely easy to go change so tailwind gives us that bootstrap could sort of do that but it doesn't give us as much flexibility um and so that was one of the big decisions we made like early on to go and use tailwind and then unfortunately Tailwind doesn't have any JavaScript libraries for modals and drop downs and tabs and that stuff. So we had to create that from scratch using stimulus as well. Um, but, you know, here we are months later and we have all this stuff finally working. But boy, it's taken, taken quite a long time. So yeah, I'm excited to finally start onboarding some people and seeing how they like it and whatever. It's kind of... Um, you know, clearly positioned for anybody that's trying to start uh, a actual, you know, product that sells, that makes money. Like we can set this up so that uh, it does one-time payments too, but it kind of does uh, subscriptions by default. So. Yeah, it's cool. <clears throat> um, it's on rail six. I don't know if we mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all Webpacker and I mean that, uh, is using Webpacker 4. I've tried to keep everything as up-to-date as possible with Rails 6. Uh, action text, active storage, all that stuff is already set up and pre-configured for you, including action text has user mentions built in, which is pretty sweet. So if you want to drop that into comments or anything like that, you just get user at mentions by default, and it'll display their avatar and all that stuff. So it's pretty cool, too. Um it it should just be like an incredibly easy way to start a simple, you know, product. Um, so I'm excited. It, it, it should be fun. We spent quite a bit of time on it and probably one of the questions anybody has that's checked out bullet train before is like, what's the difference? And really, you know, ours isn't intended to be as like full 
featured as bullet train bullet trains also uh significantly more expensive but you get kind of a significantly more of a personal uh support for that in a sense and um he's kind of tailoring exactly what they're building in the future for all that to whatever his customers are asking for so you know his price point makes it a different kind of purchase but it's also an awesome you know alternative if if that's if you've got 1500 bucks and you want to do that that's kind of a great option too so you know there's uh there's cool stuff going on in the community right now i'm like pretty excited cuz we've talked many times about you know we want stuff to be a little bit more um entrepreneurial or whatever like the early days of rails that was kind of like hey if you want to build a product like rails is kind of the perfect framework and that seems to have sort of moved on a bit um and moved on to the the laravel php world which is great but i would love the the rails community to kind of revive that too and so you know hopefully these things are uh pushing the right direction for all that yeah uh so i actually started building a SaaS app i didn't use jumpstart rails because i started building it in hanami uh that's that'll be interesting to see uh all the comparisons yeah so i was hesitant to do it because like 1.3 is the current version or like 131 and hanami 2 is around the corner and it doesn't like seem like the upgrade path is going to be like the easiest. Maybe that'll change. Um, but the vibe I kind of got was that like, it's a big change. So what, uh, are, so there are architectural changes or, or like what's the, what's, what's going to make it a hard upgrade. I think it's architecture, the way like configurations done, things like that. And, um, the, Oh yeah, you were out that episode where I talked to Luca. Yeah, so there's uh there's quite a bit and like they're working really heavily with the dry RB and like ROM projects. Mm-hmm. Like they're all all three of those projects are working together. So but I went ahead and I figured like so when I gave my talk the other night about using Ruby in twenty nineteen, I spent probably like forty percent of the time talking about ROM RB, dry RB and Hanami. And, like, I had this realization that, like, I've been, like, preaching the gospel of Hanami since, like, pre-1.0, but I've never, like, really built anything in it. Like, I always just, like, oh, that's so cool. Rails. Uh, so, I said, I, I'm going to do this. And if it's hard to upgrade, it's hard to upgrade. Yeah. So. That's interesting. I, I've still been meaning to play with stuff, but... Uh, I just don't have the time, you know, I wish I did. Uh, and I need to just maybe grab one of those, uh, libraries and just use them in an app of mine or something. Um, just to, to get some experience with them. Cause I, th- I think a lot of it's super interesting and probably some pretty valuable or useful things. And, uh, you know, I just, I think I tend to use the same stuff I'm already familiar with cause that's that's the fastest way to go build something, but it might prove to be beneficial or help me think about attacking problems in different ways by trying out some of those those libraries. So I, I should make a effort to go and do that sometime soon. Yeah, it's fun. I like I've been like craving programming again, which is kind of cool. Mm, that's good. Yeah, I just. It's it's similar in that like it's an MVC framework and it's Ruby, but like everything else is different. Uh, and so like everything's a lot like tinier pieces. Like each controller actions its own class, and it's super easy to test because like everything's just a lot more contained and smaller. And I really like that. Uh, the thing, the two things that were like kind of a learning experience for me, which like if I was trying to like get this out the door tomorrow would have slowed me down. But uh, we were talking about Tailwind. Like, so I use Tailwind pretty much for everything I can now. 
uh, like the Southeast Ruby side is actually built with like the Tailwind Webpack starter kit. And so I've never actually set up Webpack from scratch. Uh, you know, with Rails, Webpacker does all that. Mm-hmm. So that was a little, not difficult, but it was a learning curve. But I've got it running. And then the other thing that was like slowed me down a little bit was there is no like authentication like package. Like there's a couple, but they're not necessarily maintained. Mm, And so I like, I built one from scratch that I haven't done before. And when I say scratch, I mean, I use Warden. Okay. Yeah. Warden for anybody that isn't familiar is what powers devise. So the real authentication work happens in Warden and then devise is like, your controllers and your email or uh, forgot your password and all those things. Yeah. Uh, and I learned a ton about Warden the last couple of weeks. Um, and it's really, it's, I mean, authentication is a little bit complex, but the way Warden does, it's actually like pretty simple because it's literally just like middleware. And then it, uh, you tell it, like if you're using sessions, like you tell it what the user is. And so like, I just define it as like, pull this user from the database. If this ID exists, it's really cool. Hmm. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I'm not the fastest at it because it like, I'm, you know, I'm used to using rails, but it's been an absolute joy. I don't know. <laughs> That's good. You just need those sometimes, you know? Yeah, it's just different, but it's still Ruby. And, uh, like, I wanted to use ROM with it. So, like, Hanami model is actually built on ROM. Okay. But I thought about using, like, just ROM by itself. But I figured I had enough learning curves already. What uh, what does Hanami ROM, or what Hanami models do in addition to ROM? So... It's like a wrapper around it. I don't know all the specifics. Um, but like the the actual like working with the database happens in repositories, which I think is ROM. And then like entities are like the actual models. But unlike active record, it's not like both those concepts aren't together. Like a model isn't supposed to know about the da- – an entity isn't supposed to know about the database – and like res- repository is responsible for that. And so I think that's where it kind of splits apart. I'm kind of speaking ignorantly. Um, mm. And hopefully we'll have uh, the creator of ROM on soon to talk about that. But yeah, it's fascinating. It's a nice mental shift and it's still Ruby. Yeah. 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 Really nice. Yeah. That's cool. I uh, need to play with that too sometime. Um, uh, uh, my anytime I'm like tempted to fiddle with a new framework, um, for some reason my attention always goes to like Crystal and uh, yeah. you know the Amber framework or, or Kamal, which is like their Sinatra type of thing. Yeah, it's super fast. Yeah, yeah I, I like. Oh, I still got those those itches once in a while for like. Well, what if I could code? You know, like I normally do, but it's just super duper fast. Sounds awesome. <laughs> and it's, it's that's not really how easy it'll be to make that transition, but uh, it still tempts me I, once in a while. Think it, I don't think it's that far off, though. Uh, well, there's some big... I mean, the templates have to be compiled uh, and stuff. So it's not like, you know, it's not like a scripting language where they can just like dynamically reread the file and ev- eval it. It's like, it's got to be recompiled. So, um, sure. There, there are like some actual like things that are just naturally harder because of that. But, um, you know, the, the framework itself is actually quite a long ways along and they even have, you know, WebSocket support and whatever too. So, I, I I think um, what I may do is actually make um, some sort of additional screencast for Go Rails that uh, cover that at some point. I'll probably just do a walkthrough. I remember, you know, Ryan Bates did some Meteor screencasts when that got announced, and it was kind of uh, 
everybody's kind of like, ooh, is he going to switch over to doing Meteor full time and, you know, start making Meteor casts? Uh, but that, that didn't happen. And then he just disappeared forever and we were all sad. And we... <laughs> No way to contact. I actually tried to uh, see if he would come on this show, but I don't know how to get a hold of him. Mm. So I, he he still tweets or did come back for Twitter a little bit. So you could slide into those DMs, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Crystal's super cool. Uh, I feel like if I was gonna pick up something new, it'd probably be like Go or Crystal, and just like be a different language entirely. Uh, yeah, this this felt like so. Like I am trying to like build this like SaaS app. So like at the same time, I wanted to be a little bit productive, and this felt like a good in between. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it feels like more production ready, I guess, than like a Crystal app or a a a Crystal web framework app. But I haven't looked at it in a while. The last time I looked at Crystal was in like Lucky was just getting started. Oh yeah, um, in a hot minute. Yeah, the Amber framework has come a long ways. What's kind of cool is they have um, like a Active Record compatible esque thing, but they also have uh, you know in a repository style like Ecto, um, and so there's some neat uh, things going there. But the, th the thing is. Like at this point, Active Record has so many years of bug fixes and like features that ugh, it's you're gonna you're gonna almost certainly run into significant amounts of issues over time. At at the beginning when you're doing simpler things, you're probably gonna be just fine. But then if you start doing more complicated things, you better be prepared to work on the framework. I think and just cause it's that new and even crystal has not ever hit 1.0 or something. So that's probably not a, you know, a great uh, sign for sort of the, the speed with which you'll be able to work. I, I imagine you're going to run into some things. So the non one Oh thing has been a thing that's like, I like, it wasn't much. I was giving like 20 or 25 bucks to crystal a couple of years ago. Cause I was like, this is cool. Like I want to fund this, uh, but it, I don't know, not being one. Oh, kind of slowed me down on that. I was like, well, yeah, and it's, I'm not using the crystal. And it's interesting too, of like, what does it mean to be 1.0? Um, just cause you're like, uh, like maybe the, maybe the features that I need or whatever are like just fine. Um, but, Maybe it means because they're on what 0 0.27 right now. So potentially that means like they're going to be major like standard library changes that are going to force you to rewrite things. And that could be awful. Like that may not be what you want to spend your time on. And it could be great for a side project, but not a new, you know, business app or something that you plan on making money from that's kind of always the tough trade off. Like you'd love to use the stuff, but then like for something you're actually having r actual customers on, you need something stable so that you are ideally there's no bugs with the language or the library that you're using. It's just bugs with your code that you wrote. Um, but this may not be the case uh, with something like that. Yeah, it's one of the reasons like I've stayed in Ruby. Uh and that's actually part of that talk I gave is like Ruby's just for the most part really stable. Like Yeah, I mean, even Rails like they're just adding new features. They're not changing anything major. This, Ruby hasn't really I mean, what? Ruby 2.0 was kind of the only major thing that I, I think, really Yeah, 187 to uh, one nine three or whatever one nine and chances are i mean i don't know of a whole lot of changes for existing stuff for ruby three by three other than their goal is to add some better concurrency and you know speed so potentially that's not many changes either yeah i don't know so that i don't know that's kind of the reason everything you're saying is kind of the reason i went like with this because i went something different like i i don't 
like I like building Rails apps. Uh, but like I've been talking about this thing forever. Why not like it's time to stop being a poser? So it's been fun though. Like I plan on a finishing this application uh, and then B sharing my experience like in more detail. Cause I actually, I'm also using some dry RB libraries just directly in it using one called dry transaction, which uh, is what I'm doing for like air quote service objects. And it's really cool. Huh. So, okay, cool. Uh, we'll have to have you on as a guest for this podcast and interview <laughs> about interview you about this in the future. <laughs> it's fun. I don't you know, like, they're, I'm going to keep, like, riding rails, uh, but it's just nice to do something different, and I'm really happy. It's really, it's a really good framework. You should, like, you should just try it. Yeah. Even, yeah. It, and that's why I did this project, because it's a very, it's a, and, like, in terms of scope, it's a very tiny project, and I was like, I can justify this. Mm, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's good. I can... I feel like I have less and less of those projects every day now. Like the things that I start now are tending to be more and more like permanent type of commitments. And so I'm always like, Oh, I'd love to, but I don't know. I don't want that to like slow me down. So yeah, it's probably just maybe not the best uh, reason. Like maybe I should just try it and see how it goes, but I don't know. I've done that before in the past and it's, it's been bad. (laughs) I get it though, like, or like I empathize with it because I'm the same way. Like, well, I could do this new thing and like get excited, or I could just get this thing done. Yeah, because like it's hard to do both. Uh, I feel like, yeah, and it's not because like X language or X framework doesn't make it easier to do those things. It's just that I'm so proficient in like the Rails ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the you're like. I mean, we're going to be those two old guys that are in their 60s, still coding, and, you know, we'll be just like those those old COBOL programmers where no one uses it anymore, and we're still sitting there, you know, working on stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. There's, there's these moments of like, man, sometimes I wish I had, uh, you know, the balance of Ruby really goes a heavy swing towards the um, programmer, you know, happiness side of things. And there are some things where I'm like, man, I wish I had stuff that weighed a little bit more on the like performance side of things. Um, And maybe those are more situations of just like, Hey, maybe I'll go write a, you know, Ruby C extension. It could be fun. Right. Um, you know, or write another service in Go or something that that works like independently or something like. A good example of that is the uh, any cable libraries, the any cable Go and Elixir um, implementations, and and those are pretty cool uh, and give you the the speed and everything that you wouldn't get just using memory usage as well. That's probably the bigger uh, thing of. Uh, using these other languages instead of Ruby for long, long term persistent connections like those. So, yeah, that uh, performance is a whole thing we will talk about with one of our guests at RailsConf. So, boom. Well, it is time for me to go eat dinner. Yeah, I'm pretty hungry too. I intended to go out earlier and grab food. And then I got talking to my neighbor for like an hour and then it was time to record the podcast. And I, so I left the house, went across the street and came right back home. I didn't (laughs) didn't get any food at all. So I'm hungry. (laughs) Go get you some food. We'll talk soon. Cool. All right. Talk to you later, man.